check, check.
Good morning, everybody. Will you stand with me today? Before we enter into a time of worship, I just wanted to share some things that have been on my heart. My name's Darcy. For those that don't know me, and we are so glad that you're here. Um, this week, I started to think about the power of worship, right, and how worship sets the tone. Um, growing up, Worship was always part of my life, right? It was always going. My mom, if you still call her today, she'll go, Alexa, pause, because there's always music going on in the house. And then whenever I had my babies, um, something called Praise Baby was like my lifesaver. It would give me 20 minutes of sanity because I would put it on, and it was like Baby Einstein for babies, but all worship music so anointed. It would shift the atmosphere. A crying baby would <sighs> exhale and calm down. So even this week, worship is a weapon, right? It's, it's an awesome weapon to have as a Christian. When we get to come into the presence of God and we get to fight our battles through worship, through acknowledging who God is. And so today, that's how we're going to start this service. I want you right now to start thinking who God is to you. Don't think about your circumstances. You might have come in here with a heavy heart. Maybe you came in here light as a bird and you're ready to, to set sail. But we're, we get to do this together. Look around. We're a family who gets to worship together. And so I'm going to challenge you right now. You're like, oh, gosh, you're making me uncomfortable. And that's okay. <laughs> I want you right now, let's just start lifting up a song of praise. I'm, I want to hear you. You can join with us. We're not kicking off yet. Let's start worshiping in our own way. Let's declare who Jesus is. God, we thank you for who you are. God, I thank you that you have never left me, that you have never forsaken me. I thank you, God, that you've been a strong tower, a safe place of refuge for my heart. God, I thank you that you've been a friend whenever I have felt lonely. God, I thank you that you are always with me. I thank you for the victories that are yours. I thank you for the words that you have spoken that will come to pass because your promises are yes and amen. I thank you, God, that you are a good shepherd, a shepherd who knows what my heart needs, a shepherd who guides me, who protects me. A shepherd who, who bites off the enemy. I thank you that you set a table in the presence of my enemies, God. What a good God you are. There is nobody like you. And today, God, we lay everything that could be distracting us, what we walked in here with at these altars, at your feet. I pray for those that have walked in with the spirit of heaviness that they will have a spirit of joy. Lord, I pray that we will put on our garments of praise this morning and, and refocus on who you are today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship Jesus together.
go back to the beginning Can't control what tomorrow will be But I know here in the middle Is the place where you promise to As I walk now through the valley, let your love rise above everything. Like the sun shaping the shadow, in my weakness, your glory appears. 
right now I'm just feeling that there might be somebody in this room that this week you cried out to God and said, I want to go back to where I used to be with you. My faith in you. Maybe you were a little child and you had amazing faith. Maybe you were a young adult and you had big dreams for what God was going to do in and through your life. Maybe you only gave your heart to God later in your life. I know I prayed that prayer actually recently. God, I want a fresh touch. I want I want some of these words to come to pass that you gave me. I'm anxious. I'm excited, but I'm, I'm getting a little weary. And you just need a touch. This week with our kids, we are big fans of The Chosen. And I don't want to ruin anything for you if you're not caught up, but sorry. <laughs> um, because it was such a powerful episode this past week about the woman with the issue of blood of Jairus and his daughter. And you cannot help but feel the emotion of the episode, right? It doesn't take a lot for me to feel emotions, but maybe if you're not even a feeling kind of person, you felt it because she just she had such faith. I just need to touch the hem of his garment. Just one touch will change my whole world. One touch will change everything. That's the kind of faith that she had is that I don't even need to have a hug from him. I don't even need him to speak a word to me. I just, I just need to touch him. And I believe that a miracle would take place. So before we transition, I don't want to miss this opportunity that maybe you are in this room and you just need one touch from Jesus today. One encouraging moment with the Lord, the Savior of the world that could change your life. And if that's you, I'm going to ask you to be bold today and to raise your hand because we're going to pray together. I really believe in unity and power of praying together, of standing with each other. There's nothing like knowing that you're not alone, just straight up. <laughs> so I see some hands. Do not, be, do not be afraid today. I'm going to ask you if that's you. You need one touch from Jesus today. You need a word. You need something. You just need you just need them. There's hands going up all around this place. And if you feel led, go pray with somebody today. And we're, gonna, we're going to approach Jesus with the same bold faith that woman with the issue of blood had, that she was bold, that she was relentless. She ignored caution. She actually ignored Jewish law because she was unclean. And she touched somebody. She had enough faith. So let's, let's have faith together. Jesus, we thank you for who you are today. God, I, I know that you are here in this place. Lord, I come to you on behalf of my friends today, Lord, that need a touch from you. And I pray right now, Holy Spirit, that you will come that you will come in the most beautiful way that only you can do. Lord, I pray that you will start to speak to hearts, that you will start reminding them of things whenever they were a child, God. I pray that you will spur up faith inside of their bones. God, I pray that they will want to, to move in the actions that you have for them, God. I pray that they won't become weary in doing good because, God, you care about their hearts. You care about who they are. Lord, I pray for healing right now. 
Lord, I pray for those that need a touch from you, from the great physician, the one that can, can make dead men rise, God. I pray for that, that kind of faith, that kind of healing to, to come through this room right now. Lord, we believe. We believe that you can do it. Lord, I pray that you will just speak words of love and encouragement over hearts, over minds. Lord, I pray against every mind that's been boggled with listening to the enemy, speaking things over them that are not true, for placing things of doubt inside of their minds. We pray right now for a mind of peace, a mind that has the mind of Christ, that Lord, that when they think about themselves that they don't think from a different perspective but they think how you view them we declare healing right now we declare restoration it's one of my favorite things about you Jesus is that you take things and you confound us with things that don't make sense Lord that you do you give us dancing instead of mourning that you give us joy instead of grief. I pray right now, Lord, that you will do what you want to do today. Come meet us again. Come be a personal God to us again. Be a life-speaking God to us. A God that's that's never changed. The God who spoke to people long ago, Lord, you can do it again. Can we sing that just real soft again as we close this moment? unseen right now, to believe in the God that we serve, to believe that you are good, that you are faithful.
that you are a God of intentionality, that you are a God of purpose, that you don't waste anything. We thank you, Jesus. Thank you for coming, Holy Spirit, for being present. Seal this moment on our hearts this week, God, that you, that you are close. And I pray, Lord, that you will bind up the brokenhearted today. Those who are feeling just really sad. I pray for joy. Joy despite their circumstances. Joy that just replaces the feelings of doubt, the feelings of uncertainty. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You guys may be seated. Thank you for responding to what God wants to do today. I entered this church today with, with great anticipation for what God wants to speak to our hearts. And if you're new today, you're like, okay, <laughs> we want to say hi. <laughs> We're so glad that you are here with us and that you are visiting Genesis. And if you are here for the first time, um, I pray that you will feel Jesus and, and know that he is real and if you're new, if you can text the word new to this number up on the screen, 812-393-1410, we would love to just send you a, a digital gift card to Starbucks to say thank you for coming, to connect with you, and to, to let you know all the great things that are happening here at Genesis. Um, today is also a great day because we have our next steps meeting, our next steps lunch today right after service and if you're like what is that well i'm gonna tell you it is um, an exciting time because we are ready for what god wants to do in this place right and when i look around this room there's people who have yet to be um part of what god is doing as far as the serving aspect of it and so today is um, a time to get plugged in, to hear all about the opportunities to get plugged in. Also, if you are interested in being water baptized or to dedicate your baby, um, this is for you too. And if you have not RSVP'd, th that's okay. Just come. Um, we'll make room. We'll pray that God multiplies the lasagna. You know, it will be great. And um, I said it earlier, but I really, like, you know how certain people have certain things that are, like, really important to them? And for me, one of the things that's really important is that everybody has a place to belong and everybody has a place to, to give of themselves, of their talents, of their time, of their treasures, of the things that God's entrusted to you. And so we need you. Um, it's great to have us do certain things, but I'm probably not the perfect person to do certain things, if you hear what I'm saying, right? Like, we need you. You need us. We need each other. Look at your neighbor and say, we need you. You are a valued member of Genesis. And so we want you to be part of this and not miss out. Um, if you're ever like, I'm feeling disconnected, get involved. That's a great place to not feel disconnected of the heartbeat of what's going on. If you're ever like, I don't know, I feel like I'm missing out on things. Come to the Next Steps Luncheon and we will tell you all about the exciting ways that you get to serve at this awesome church. And also, so next week, everybody say next week, we're going back to two services. <laughs> so don't come at 10. You'll be like right dab in the middle, and you'll be weird, and it won't be good. And so just come 9 o'clock or 11 o'clock next week. Um, I can't believe we're already like more than halfway through January. But also um, next week is our annual vision meeting. And if you're like, what is this? This is kind of like the annual business meeting. This is the time that we get to talk about all the things that happened last year in anticipation of what's going to happen this year. And so you are welcome to come. There's the packets um, at the old coffee bar, like the welcome desk um, with all the reports. If you want to get a head start and read those, pick one of those up on your way out today. And um, I really think that it's awesome to to 
discuss this kind of stuff. You know, I'm a talker. I like to talk, but I also like to hear what God is doing and to hear from the ministry heads of what is going on and to be a support and to get behind the vision, aka the vision meeting, of what's going on here at Genesis. So mark it for next week, two services, and then also the vision meeting at 1 o'clock. Um, so it's a busy month here in January, guys. Um, I have another announcement. <laughs> so um, anybody remember Jamie Englehart? Yeah? <laughs> I hear my kids going, yes. Um, he is coming as our guest speaker on January 29th. We're going to have him back with us. And if you don't know who he is, he um, is actually one of EJ's spiritual fathers. He has a gift and a grace on his life to speak truth and to not shy away from truth and to speak it with love and a little bit of gruffness in his voice. I can't do his voice like my kids try to do. But um, he's going to be here for 9 and 11 o'clock, but this is where I want you to pay attention. We're also going to have him back for a 6 o'clock service that evening on the 29th. And the 6 o'clock service will be a special time of worship um, and prophetic ministry and just saying, hey, God, we're here. What do you want to do? And so you don't want to miss out on that. Um, anybody grow up, like, going to Sunday night services, like, every Sunday night? Okay, I did, too. It was, like, a non-negotiable um, in our house. And so we don't do a lot of extended Sunday evenings. And so I'm, I'm not begging you, but I'm excitingly pleading with you to not miss out because I love the extra times that we meet together, that we give our hearts um, of one mind, one body to the Lord to say, hey, what do you want to speak to us? And so that's going to be on January 29th. And so we are going to be taking a love offering for him, and we love to give generously. Um, we want to be known as a generous church, a church that loves well through our generosity. So come prepared to give in those services to Jamie. He doesn't require anything. He's not one of those guest speakers that gives you a fee that you have to accommodate before they come. He comes in complete faith. And so um, people who live by faith, God uses us to also support them. So um, before we move on into what else God wants us to do, speaking of giving, we are thankful for your generosity and your tithes and your offerings. If you're new, this is not for you. This is for our regular attenders. Um, that there are certain ways to give. You can give online, you can give in mail, you can give in the back at the giving station. And we're thankful for the, um, the consistency of your giving because God um, takes it and he multiplies it. And it's awesome how he can do that. Only God can do that, right, in amazing ways. And so um, let's pray before we have um, Pastor EJ come up with uh, another testimony. But Lord, we just thank you that you can take the little that we have and make it grand. And God, I thank you that you um, put it on our hearts to give and that we don't give out of obligation, but that we give out of love for you and the body that we are part of. And so I thank you for those that are faithful in their giving. God, I pray that you will bless them abundantly. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, hey, everyone, we've been doing something for the past couple weeks uh, where we've told you about Renew Academy and this uh, very intentional discipleship uh, cohort that we've been doing. Um, and so this past fall, we did one all about how to make disciples. And part of that was learning how to what, what even is a testimony, but also learning how to give a testimony. And so you've been hearing from some different people. I hope it's been ministering to you. I know it has been to me. Um, and it's just been good hearing the stories of people in our body that we do life with, we're around, we see, we have full conversations, but we don't really know. And so that's been a huge part of this as well. And so I'm going to invite Kathy Sanders to come on up. She's going to share her testimony with us today. Can you welcome her? Thank you, Pastor. It's only by God's grace that I'm able to stand up here before you. Hello, my name is Kathy, and I'm here to tell you a story. It's a story of adventure with twists, turns, ups and downs, joy and sadness. Once upon a time, 
There was a little girl born on Valentine's Day to an Air Force family that became a mom, dad, four younger siblings, two dogs, a quail, flying squirrel, and a few cats along the way. They traveled all over the U.S. in a station wagon and even overseas to Germany. Overall, her, child was, was, her childhood was happy with lots of good memories, except for a great darkness that crept into her life in her early years. But she was able to lock that away, out of sight, out of mind, or so she thought. Meanwhile, she grew up saying her prayers at night and mealtimes and going to church occasionally. Until she was 14 years old, at a tent revival with twinkling lights and stars above, she accepted Jesus as her Savior and was baptized in a nearby creek. Such joy unspeakable, but... After trying unsuccessfully to live a good and perfect life, she gave up and said goodbye to Jesus, crying every night for three weeks, and vowed to live the best bad life that she could, nearly dying in the process. The darkness and pain that she had buried long ago erupted into chaos. Until one night on Mars Hill in Indianapolis, she heard God's voice calling her name once again. He had never stopped pursuing me, and I began the journey homeward. There I met a man who would become my husband. He had a Christian friend, Cindy, who shared her testimony about Jesus. I knew what I had to do, live for Jesus. This time was different as he began the work of transformation in me by his word, his Holy Spirit. I wasn't perfect. I was being perfected. There's been healing, forgiveness, hope, joy. I've been a wife, mother, grandma, mima, nurse, widow, retired to become a missionary, here at home and across the globe, to tell others about Jesus and the difference he makes. My daughter shared this verse with, from Psalm 107 too. Let the redeemed of the Lord tell their story, those he redeemed from the hand of the foe. And these lyrics by Matthew West sum it all up. All of me, all for you. Let all I say, all I do, Point to the one who changed my life. All for you, not for me. My story, your story, God's glory. Amen. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. Is this, and is this your daughter with you? Hi. <laughs> Thanks for being here, guys. That was awesome. She did great, huh? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, grandson approved. <laughs> All right, everyone. Well, hey, I don't want to waste, uh, well, we're not wasting time. This has been great. But uh, I don't want to take any more time just talking. Um, I could talk about how good God is all day long. But uh, we got some work to do in Ruth. And so uh, today, Leslie is sharing. And so would you welcome Leslie as she comes to deliver the word? Can you hear me? Okay. Sorry, I have a cough drop in my mouth. I'm not sick, but I was sick at Thanksgiving, and I have this, like, dry throat. Has anybody else, like, got sick and had these, like, lingering things, right? It's crazy. So, anyway, I'm sorry if I have this in my mouth for now and if I keep taking drinks, but I want to get through this, and usually if I talk a lot, my, my voice gets a little tired. So, I will make it. Lord, help me out here. Okay. <laughs> So, uh, I'm so excited that we're in Ruth chapter 4. Um, I just want to say thank you to Pastor EJ for taking us through Ruth. It's been super good. Um, great. Luke's been great. Darcy's been great. EJ's been great. It's, um, it's one of those books that if you look up Ruth, you'll see all these, like, movies that have been made about Ruth. You'll see all the children's stories about Ruth. Um, we've done Bible stories and Bible studies, I mean, on Ruth. You know, we've, we've read this book over and over and over. But what I love about the Bible is you can read the same thing. Till for all eternity, 
and get something out of it new every single time. See something differently, right? The Lord can give you something that you never saw before. He can illuminate something that you didn't see quite that way. He can give you more detail about something. And that's what's been happening in Ruth for me. And it's been really awesome. And I hope that's been happening for you too. Um, And I'm excited to get through this. So I have most of chapter four today. So I'm going to read verses one through 12. uh, And then we'll go through it. Um, The Lord sort of changed this teaching up on me four or five times. So we'll see how this goes today. Uh, let's start in chapter one and it should be up on the screen. I mean, chapter four, verse one should be up on the screen. Now Boaz had gone up to the gate and sat down there. Behold, the redeemer of whom Boaz had spoken came by. So Boaz said, turn aside friend and sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. And then he took men and the elders into the city and said, sit down. So they also sat down. He said to the redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, is selling a parcel of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. So I thought I would tell you of it and say, but it is in the presence of those sitting here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not, tell me that I may know, for there is no one besides you to redeem it, and I come after you. And he said, I will redeem it. But then Boaz said, the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you also acquire Ruth the Moabite the widow of the dead, in order to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance. Well, then the redeemer said, well, I I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I impair my own inheritance. So go ahead and take my right of redemption yourself, for I cannot redeem it. Now, this was the custom in formal times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging. To confirm a transaction, the one drew off his sandal and gave it to the other. And this was the manner of attesting in Israel. So when the redeemer said to Boaz, buy it for yourself, he drew off his sandal. And Boaz said to the elders and all the people, you are witnesses this day that I have bought from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech and all that belonged to Kilion and to Malon. Also Ruth the Moabite, the widow of Malon, I have bought to be my wife to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brothers and from the gates of this native place. You are witnesses this day. Then all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, we are witnesses. May the Lord make the women who is coming to your house like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. May you act worthily in Ephrathah and be renowned in Bethlehem. And may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah, because of the offspring that the Lord will give you by this young woman. So what's happening here, a little recap, is that Ruth went to the threshing floor last week, we heard about this, and she said to Boaz, Uh, spread your wings over me, or marry me, basically, was her proposal. Take care of us. Marry me. Let's perpetuate a line and have an heir for Naomi uh, to provide restoration and redemption for Naomi. This will take care of Naomi, and we'll talk a little bit more about this, but uh, she says, please do this for us, and Boaz says he will, Um, but he can't really do it legally because there's somebody who's a closer kinsman to him, so he has to go to find this closer kinsman and give him sort of the first right of refusal to buy the land uh, and to marry Ruth. And so he does this. Boaz says, I'm going to take care of this matter. And he goes to the gates, and this is what happens, right? He meets the kinsman. He tells him the offer. The kinsman says he can't do it. And so Boaz takes up the responsibility. And then there's this blessing that's prayed. So we're going to talk through this story. Um, But before we do, I want to give you a little personal story to set the stage. Um, So I didn't know if I was going to do this or not, but I I think I am. So... um, We're going to call this next part Awkward Story Hour with Leslie, okay? Uh, So I am, just to give you a little insight into me, uh, I do stuff every single day that is awkward. Every day, all the time. Uh, Awkward, uncomfortable. I walk away going, oh, why did I do that? Like embarrassed of things that I've done. I say things I shouldn't say. I do things I shouldn't do. I tend to just sort of go for it, uh, and that gets me in trouble some of the time. Uh, I put my foot in my mouth. My husband is nodding. I see it out of the corner of my eye. Uh, I put my foot in my mouth a lot. Um, I just sort of jump in, and that's it's not always the best thing to do, but, you know, I, it is what it is, right? That's part of who I am. So I'm just going to give you a couple examples of this uh, from just, like, the last week, okay? So a couple of them are for you in this room, and hopefully you'll recognize yourselves and laugh. I won't use your names. Um, but first example of a four-year-old kid. I went downstairs, and these are all little things, but just, you know, ugh. anyway. So I went downstairs, I bring my son into Little Arrows, and they're having donuts. It was the week they had pajamas downstairs, right? And I'm like, oh, donuts, I love donuts. And I'm like going on and on about donuts. And my friend is down there, and she's there because her son has all these food allergies, and he can't have donuts. 
So she's there giving him another snack. And I know this, right? She's my friend. We've talked about this. We've talked about kind of how hard it is that he has all these food sensitivities and how she's trying to find ways to get him to not feel left out and have other treats that he likes, right? And I'm aware of all of this. But instead of being aware of all of that, I'm like going on and on and on in front of her, in front of her kid. Donuts are great. Don't you love donuts? Aren't donuts wonderful, right? Just over and over and over and over. Just can't stop myself. So I'm going on and on and on. And I'm like, yeah, donuts. And she's like politely like, yeah, great. So then I leave and I walk up the steps and I'm like, oh my gosh. You know, at some point I think I said, who doesn't love donuts to this kid? And it's like, he doesn't love donuts. He's allergic to donuts, Leslie. So it's things like that. Those are the kinds of things that I do on a regular basis. Like not intentionally insulting people, not intentionally being rude, but kind of regular things that I do. So another thing is like, and maybe you have experienced this too, is when you have to get up to go to the bathroom when someone's up here preaching, all of a sudden I'm like, oh gosh, which path do I take? Who do I walk by? Do I have to make eye contact with everyone that I walk by? Do I, do, maybe you don't have these crazy thoughts in your head. I do. So I'm like, all right, either I put my head down and just like beeline it out the door and ignore everyone around me, or I'm like the mayor and I'm like, hey, how you doing? Hi, how's it going, right? And I'm saying hi to everyone that I go by. So usually I sort of land somewhere in the middle, and it's not a big deal. Like, the moment passes, and I don't feel weird about it anymore. But every time I'm about to get up to go, I'm like, oh, gosh. Okay, here we go. So I walk past, and, and last week or the week before, I forget, but I go like this, you know, the awkward, like, hey, how's it going to someone? And they reciprocate, and they're like, hey. For some reason, when they do that, I think they want a high five. <laughs> Why not? So I, like, go in to, like, give them a high five as I'm walking by, and they're like, I can see their face, like, oh, gosh, she's, she's coming at me, right? So I go to give them a high five, and I sort of, like, realize it and pull back. And so then I grab their hand, and I'm like, and, like, awkwardly, I'm now, like, holding someone's hand as I'm walking to the bathroom. I'm like, oh, my gosh. So I get in the hallway, and I'm like, why am I so weird, right? Why am I so awkward, right? And then I move past it, and it's done. But just stuff like this all the time. Um, and if you don't do things like this, please teach me your ways because I do this kind of stuff all the time. And I'm hoping some of you at least can, you know, believe this with me, right? You do this too. Uh, so I'll give you kind of a bad one. Um, this is bad. Okay, so uh, I'm in this networking group with this guy. So I know him pretty well. I see him every week. And I meet his wife. We're out and about, and I see him. I'm like, hey. So I introduce myself. He introduces her. I kind of get to know her. We talk about our kids. They have two little kids. And then over the next, you know, couple months, I see them out quite, quite a bit, right? I see them having dinner. I see them, what I presume is on, like, date nights. I see them at events. And I just sort of get to know her a little bit. We're obviously not friends, but apparently I think we are. So I know her really well, right, really well. And I've met her, talked to her, talked to him. So one morning, we're in this networking group. And every week in this networking group, somebody gives a presentation. They talk about their personal life and their business just to help everybody get to know each other better. So it's his week to present. So he's telling us about his family. And he's talking about his girls, his daughters. He's going on and on and on about his daughters. And he says, that's my family. And then he starts to move on, and he doesn't mention his wife. So, of course, it's my job to bring up his wife. So I'm like, oh, don't forget about, you know, and I say his wife's name. And he sort of sheepishly smiles and looks down and and then goes, okay, so about my business, and keeps talking. And I'm like, well, that was really weird. So the guy next to me leans over and says, Leslie, obviously you don't know this, but they're kind of going through a messy divorce right now. And I'm like, oh, that's great. I just made this guy feel really bad in front of this whole entire group because I thought I knew her so well, and I knew their perfect family, and I understood something that I did not understand. Afterwards, I kind of made a beeline to him and grabbed him and was like, so sorry, you know. I'm so sorry to hear you're going through that and praying for you. He's a Christian, and we've had these talks. But it was just like, oh, why? Why? Why did I do that? Why do I have to interject myself in these situations? So anyway, I could give you a 1,000 of these. That was just like this week or two weeks, right, in the last couple of weeks. Uh, and I just picked some. Um, this happens to me all the time. All the time. Um, yeah, okay. So th this is my life. And, and I'm, I'm thinking that even if it's not awkward things that you have happened to you that you maybe wish you hadn't done, that we all do things that we do, do and then we go, oh, yeah, probably shouldn't have done that, right? Um, like this morning, for example, I snapped at my children because I couldn't find what I wanted to wear. Uh, and then as soon as I did it, I'm like, why did I do that? What, that's not their fault that I can't find what I don't want to wear, right? Uh, I, or I am rude to my husband, and then immediately I'm like, oh, 
he doesn't deserve that. I don't want to be that kind of person. But honestly, a lot of the times I'm slow to apologize. Because apologizing is kind of hard. And I'm a little prideful. So it's a little embarrassing to admit when you do something wrong, right? I've gotten better at it over time, and Jesus is going to help me continue to get better. But these are the kinds of things I do, right? I, I get hurt by somebody, or somebody does one of those awkward things to me, and I take it the wrong way. And I think, oh, well, that was really rude, right? And over the years, I've learned to have grace for people because I want people to have grace for me because I'm so awkward. Uh, and I hope that they don't take things the wrong way when I put my foot in my mouth or make mistakes. But we all do these kinds of things. We all bumble around, and, and it's because relationships are complicated and people are complicated, right? Every relationship that you have with somebody takes a little bit of risk. If I get into a relationship with you, there's some risk that I could get hurt. There's some risk that I'm going to be exposed, that you're going to see some of my flaws and challenges, right? And so when I do those kinds of things, my natural inclination is to just, like, crawl in a hole, and be like, I should quit my networking group. I should never go out in public again. I can't go back to church, right? I mean, it's things like that where, like, immediately I'm like, oh, oh. But you know what? We don't do that, do we? We re-engage in the world after we have these strange and uncomfortable encounters with one another because life is relational. Because God is relational. And he wants us to have these messy, awkward things with one another because we're all a little bit like that. I know I'm kind of exposing myself, but I have a feeling that some of you can relate to this, that you all have done things that you're like, oh, gosh, in this relationship, I sort of stepped on my foot there. I said something I shouldn't have said, or I wish I had said something that I didn't say, right? We all sort of do this in relationships. So why do we stay in there with people? Why do we open ourselves up back to those kinds of relationships? And it's really because Jesus died for us to have relationship with him and to have relationship with one another. He is a relational God. And so that's what I want to talk about this morning is I want to talk about this, this value of engaging in relationships even though they're difficult, even though they're messy, even though we, we mess up all the time in them. Every single day I'm messing up in my relationships. And every single day the Lord asked me to keep going, to keep doing better the next time. Try again, Leslie. Get up and try again. Right? Represent Jesus to somebody else. Show the heart of God to somebody. Uh, be used how I'm asking you to be used, despite all of that stuff that you struggle with. Get in there and keep being in relationship, even when it's hard and even when it's messy and even when it's difficult. Okay, so this brings me to my big idea today. You can go to the next slide. God will use you as you are if you are willing. So I think regularly that there's better people to be up here than me. I wonder all the time why God asked me to teach. I am not qualified. None of us are qualified, are we? It's only through his grace and through a relationship with him that we can function at all, honestly, that we're not constantly hurting one another that we're co not constantly sinning or doing the wrong thing. It's by his grace alone that we get anything right. And when we lean into him and when we are willing to do what God calls us to do, he will use us. No matter what flaws and challenges we have, he will use us. And hopefully, eventually, right, he helps us to overcome some of those things and to be more and more like him. But in the meantime, none of us is ever going to be totally sanctified and totally perfect until that beautiful day comes, right? I don't know it longer do awkward things. But in the meantime, he will use you in all your wonderful glory, in all of your mess, in all of your challenges. He wants to use you if you are willing. John 13, 34 says, love one another just as I have loved you. You must also love one another. It doesn't say you have to do it correctly. It doesn't say you can't make any mistakes. It doesn't say once you have your you know, theology degree, go love somebody. Once you've been in church long enough, then you can go love somebody. Once you've gotten healed of that sin in your life, then you can go love somebody. That's not what it says. It says, go love one another. Go. Go as you are and love one another. Most of the time when we do this, uh, we do make mistakes. We try to love each other and we get it wrong over and over and over again. But God sees your heart. 
He sees your intent. Your intent is to say yes to him and to love one another and to show his love to each other. So many of you, you've probably heard of one of the most famous speeches uh, by President Theodore or Teddy Roosevelt called The Man in the Arena. You ever heard of this speech? Those of you, many of you have heard it before. Well, I want to play it this morning, and then I want to talk a little bit about it. So can you guys put that on for me? The poorest way to face life is to face it with a sneer. There are many men who feel a kind of twisted pride and cynicism. There are many who confine themselves to criticism of the way others do what they themselves dare not even attempt. There is no more unhealthy being, no man less worthy of respect, than he who either really holds or feigns to hold an attitude of sneering disbelief toward all that is great and lofty, whether in achievement or in that noble effort which, even if it fails, comes to second achievement. It is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles, or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who was actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again. Because there is no effort without error and shortcoming but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. I love that speech. I love it. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, who errs, who comes short again and again and again, you heard my stories, right? Again, and again, and again. But who spends himself in a worthy cause. You know, relationship with one another is a worthy cause. Engaging in difficult and hard and messy relationships is, is worth airing again and again and again. It's worth getting into the arena. And I love the book of Ruth because this is what these characters do. They make choices over and over and over again, kind of regular, everyday choices. Uh, over and over and over again to try to do what God is calling them to do. And maybe they get it right and maybe they don't, but they're willing to step into the arena. They're willing to go forward with what God is asking them to do. Their intent is to obey the Lord. Their intent is to do what EJ has been telling us all along, is to provide and show the loving kindness of God, the chesed of God. And we've heard this in this series over and over, but I want to show it to you again because it's so important. It's really the core of what these characters are doing is they're, th through relationship, they're showing the loving kindness of God. We've, you've heard this before. God is, you know, sort of absent in this book. He's not obviously absent, but we don't talk about him. The narrator doesn't talk about him as a character in the story. Uh, what happens is you see these people living the way that God's asking them to live and living life and trying to go after God's heart. And you see his loving kindness is shown through their actions. And so this word has said, I think there's a slide up about it, it's uh, God's loving kindness. And it's not merely an emotion or a feeling. It's not a feeling of love or a feeling of kindness towards somebody else, but it actually involves action. It involves action. So you can be a Christian and you can feel like, oh, I have all this love that God has given me. I just love people. But are you really showing 
that love to people? How is that loving kindness in action to the people that God has put in your life each and every day? Hesed describes this sense of love and loyalty that inspires merciful and beautiful, compassionate action towards people. It's not enough just to love God and to say you love other people and to sit in a pew on Sunday morning and to go back and sit in your house and go about your, your merry way. Showing the loving kindness of God, being a Christian, is about being in the arena. It's about getting in there with people. You know, Darcy was talking about, uh, I need a fresh word from the Lord. I need a God to meet me. And, and God does that, right? He shows up in a church service. He'll meet you in your bedroom. He'll show up and give you a word. But a lot of times the way God meets us is through one another. A lot of times in, in difficult times, I have encountered the word of the Lord because somebody spoke it to me. Or somebody did something for me that made me see God in a way that I needed. Right? We represent God in the world. God set it up that way. He could have just come and told all of us what to do and walked in person alongside with all of us, but he didn't, right? He asks us to go love people. He asks us to go be his representatives in the world. What is it that we are doing to be in the arena? How are we showing God's loving kindness to the people around us? And this story culminates in Boaz taking action, not just talking about how he cares for Ruth and Naomi, but he takes action in this last part of our story. He shows loving kindness to Ruth and Naomi by making um, provision for them to be redeemed. So Ruth 1, 9, Naomi um, wants Ruth to find a good husband to provide her rest or to be secure. That word means have a secure life. So Naomi wants to show loving kindness to Ruth, but Ruth doesn't have that same priority. She doesn't have that priority for herself. She's not just worried about herself. She also wants to show loving kindness to Naomi. So if she had her own priorities, she would have remarried. A younger man, maybe a richer man, um, she would have probably stayed in her own country, but she didn't. She left, she served Naomi, and when she got to Naomi's country, she could have married for love or for wealth, but she didn't. She found a match that not only would be good for her, but would care for Naomi would show God's loving kindness and compassion towards Naomi as well. You know, the, we talked about this last week a little bit, but um, it's, it needs to be said again because this is what's happening in this last part of uh, the book of Ruth, is at this point it comes to Boaz going out and making this transaction, being able to say, okay, I'm going to buy the land and I'm going to marry Ruth and I'm going to provide an heir for Naomi. Now, what was required by law was just that somebody buy the land, one of Naomi's relatives needed to buy the land and then use the proceeds from that sale to support Naomi, the widow, for the rest of her life and would have been the same for Ruth. She was a widow, so someone needed to buy the land and support the two women. And so that was this, this kinsman who we're, gonna, who we're gonna meet in our story. That was his job, and if he didn't wanna do it, it would fall to Boaz. But there was no legal requirement for anybody to marry Ruth. The levi Wright marriage was about brothers, it was about the deceased brother marrying someone. But Elimelech didn't have a brother. Malon and Chilean both died. They didn't, you know, there were no other brothers. So there was no requirement to marry Ruth. But Boaz knew that the way that Naomi and Ruth could be taken care of and fully redeemed was if he married Ruth and provided an heir for Naomi. So he had to sort of figure this out so that it would work out the best way for Ruth and Naomi. So what he says um, what he does is he sees Naomi's heart, or Ruth's heart, I'm sorry, to take care of Naomi, and he wants to serve them. He wants to take care of them. Um, and so Boaz thinks about the best way to do this. If he just goes to this next of kin and says, hey, there's some land, and you're the redeemer, and you should buy the land, the guy's going to go, yeah, I would love to buy that land. It's going to improve my lot. I can pass that land down to my heirs. I can use the proceeds to take care of Naomi and Ruth. But he doesn't have to marry Ruth. So if Boaz just went and talked to this guy in private, they would have had this conversation, and probably what would have happened is this man would have bought the land, and he would have used the proceeds to take care of Naomi and Ruth, and he wouldn't have married Ruth because he didn't have to. He may have been married already. Uh, he may have had his own heirs. And if he married Ruth and had children with her, then those heirs would not be his. They would be the heirs in the line of Elimelech. So this is what could have happened. So Boaz had to figure out how to make this happen in a way that would work the most favorably for Ruth and Naomi. At first read, you kind of think he's trying to make this work for him, 
but he's actually really, we know that Boaz is a noble man, and he's trying to take care of Ruth and Naomi. God's heart, God puts, in the Old Testament, he puts all these laws in place to make sure people do what uh, he wants them to do. So basically, one of the things that, that we heard about a couple weeks ago is that when Ruth went to glean in the fields, one of the laws was that they had to leave the outside edges ungleaned so that the poor and the widow could come in and, and have some grain, right? We know this. But Boaz went above and beyond. He didn't just do what the law required. He did more. The Bible tells us that he goes to his men and he says, actually, let her glean among the sheaves, right? Let her come into the field and take what it is she needs and don't stop her. He also says, just drop some extra on the ground because part of the custom was if there was any that they left on the ground that the poor and the widow could go through and just get the remains. So he's saying, maybe just drop a little extra on the ground for her, right? He's going above and beyond because there's the letter of the law and then there's the spirit of the law. And the spirit of the law is that God wants widows and the destitute and those who have experienced difficulties and the poor to be taken care of. God cares for those that need to be cared for. And so that's the spirit of the law. So Boaz has already shown that he's willing to go above and beyond what the law requires. And so in this situation, he's trying to find a way to go above and beyond this requirement that a kinsman buy the land and get somebody to also marry Ruth and produce an heir. And so what he does is actually extremely wise, and I, I believe he's being led by the Lord to do this, but instead of just going and talking to this guy individually, one-on-one, -on -one, he brings him in front of all these elders and witnesses. So it says that he shows up at the gates. The gates are really important for two reasons. One, uh, the gates is a place where transactions happened. It's where legal proceedings happened. It's where transactions happened in that culture. But it was also the place where everybody came in and out of. Right? It was this community threshing floor area, and this was harvest time. So everybody, every day, was going to be going in and out of these gates. So he knew if he set up at the gates and waited for the kinsmen to come through, that he would, because everybody's going through, but also that he could gather a bunch of people to witness this conversation. Because he needs some witnesses. He needs people to understand what's happening here so that he can get the best result for Ruth and Naomi. So what happens is he goes to the gates, and I'll start in verse 3. Uh, you can go to the next slide. He goes to the gates, and the first thing he says um, to this kinsman, finds the kinsman, has all these people watching him, and he says, Naomi, uh, you can go to the next one maybe. Nope, next one. Sorry. I told you the Lord's me messing me up today. Okay, so <laughs> here we go. Chapter, verse 3. Um, he says to the Redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, is selling the parcel of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. So I thought I would tell you about it and buy it in the presence of those sitting here, the presence of all of these elders and all of these people. So if you'll redeem it, then redeem it. But if not, tell me and so that I can know, for there's no one besides you to redeem it except for me. And the kinsman redeemer, who doesn't have a name in our story, uh, says, yes, I will do it. I'll take the land. Um, and again, it's, it's kind of a no-brainer. Of course, he's going to take the land. It increases his wealth. It's really got no strings attached to it. He's going to take the land. So in front of everybody, he says, yes, I want to take this land, right? Um, and then Boaz presents this in two ways on purpose. He doesn't just give the whole story. He gives the first one first to see what the guy will say. He said, oh yeah, I'm in. I'll take the land. Then he says, oh, by the way, you can't just take the land, which he could legally. You understand what's happening here. Legally, this guy can just buy the land and he doesn't have to marry Ruth. He is not legally obligated to marry Ruth. But Boaz says, oh, but actually you should really take care of Ruth. And so he presents this second thing that he has to do, which he really doesn't. But he says the second thing. Boaz says, the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you also acquire Ruth, the Moabite, the widow of the dead, in order to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance. So he's saying, oh, when you buy the field, you really, the right thing to do would be to marry Ruth, would be to produce an heir. That would be the right thing to do. All these people are watching. Are you going to do the right thing? Or are you just going to do the, the bare minimum of what's required by law? See what Boaz does? He puts this guy in a situation where he, he legally can say, no, I'm just going to buy the land and I'll use the proceeds to take care of the women. But he puts this guy in a situation where he says, are you going to just do the letter of the law? Or are you really going to follow the heart of God and provide true care and redemption for this family? What are you going to do? 
And so he does this on purpose. He sits in front of all of these people, and the man could have said, no, I'll just take the land. But it would have been a little bit like, oh, why is he doing that? You know, the right thing to do would be to marry Ruth and to produce an heir. So Boaz sets this up so that Ruth and Naomi will be cared for and taken care of. And I I truly think that Boaz is, and you don't know because it doesn't say, but it does set up Boaz as a noble man. So I really think that Boaz's intention here is not to trick this man because if the man is willing to do this, if he says, you know what, you're right. The right thing to do is to marry Ruth and to produce an heir and to redeem them. He would have, I think he really would have genuinely been happy that that was the outcome. I think he wanted to see these women cared for. He's, that was God's heart. And so he wanted to see if this man would do that. And if he would, I think he would have genuinely been happy. We don't know, but I, I do think that's what's going on here. Um, and the man said, oh, actually, you know, I, I can't do that, right? I can't marry Ruth. Um, and there's a lot of reasons that maybe he says this. It might be because she's a Moabite. He gently reminds everybody that she's a Moabite, right? It might be that he doesn't want Moabite blood uh, in his line, it might be that he, he, you know, he doesn't want to um, pass his, his own inheritance to get mixed in with this because really what happens if he marries Ruth, all of his inheritance would then be passed down to Ruth's children. So it'd be in the line of Elimelech instead of in his own line. Um, so there's really a lot to sacrifice here. This kinsman would really have to give a lot up if he chooses to marry Ruth. And Boaz is willing to do that. But this kinsman decides he's not, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's actually a rational and reasonable choice. Um, but it's interesting that Boaz is willing to make the kind of irrational, extravagant sacrifice to take care of Ruth and Naomi. Who else made an irrational, extravagant sacrifice to care for us? Jesus. Yeah, it's a little foreshadowing, right? It would have made total sense for this guy to just say, nope, my, I want my own gain. I'm just going to take the land. And, and legally, he could have done that. But Boaz says, no, the heart of the father is to serve, is to give up everything I have to make sure that these who are more vulnerable, who are in need, who are hurt, who are destitute, are cared for. And that's what Jesus did to us. We were lost without him. We are lost without him. And he comes and gave up everything that he had. He's a sacrificial king. He didn't come to rule and to reign. He came to serve so that we could rule and reign with him. And that's the story we have to tell in relationship with others. And Boaz is a foreshadowing of this. So Boaz's primary goal was to make sure that Naomi and Ruth are cared for. And one of the things I think is also interesting is he, he doesn't just want to marry them and perpetuate the line, but he wants to make sure that they are uh, loved. I think there's, there's a lot of commentary about this, and again, this isn't known in the text, but there's a lot of commentary about how would they have been treated as foreigners or as people who used to live in Moab if it wasn't for Boaz. Uh, Boaz had a higher standing than this other kinsman, and so Boaz's standing in the community, his power in the community transferred to them. Again, foreshadowing of Jesus, of what he does for us, right? His standing, his power is something that now we carry around with us, right? He's fulfilling his role, not only his legal responsibility as next of kin, but he's going above and beyond to make sure that these women are cared for. So in our story, the matter, matter is settled. The near kinsman decides he's, he's not going to do this, but Boaz will. Um, so this loving act by Boaz ensured protection and care for Ruth and Naomi. It ensured that Ruth would have everything she needed and Naomi would be fully restored and redeemed. And the story concludes with a child to perpetuate this line. And the child becomes part of the line of Jesus, which I know EJ will talk about next week. So I'm going to start to wrap up here. So Andy, if you want to come on up or worship team, if you want to make your way up here, I'm going to read the last few verses where um, he declares what it is that his intent is, what Boaz's intent is, and then this blessing that is spoken over them. So verse 9. Boaz says to the elders, you are witnesses this day that I have bought from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech and all that belonged to Kilion and Malon and also Ruth the Moabite. So again, he calls her a Moabite. Um, And what I think he's sort of saying there when he calls her the Moabite is that he knows what he's getting into. He's going into this eyes wide open. He's like, I know she's a Moabite, but I also know her heart, that she chose this God of ours that she chose to dedicate her life to her mother-in-law. 
that she chose to show the Hasid loving kindness to Naomi and go after what was best for her and not just what was best for herself, right? He's saying, I see her, I see who she is and where she came from, but I'm grafting her into my family. I'm choosing her in my family anyway. Again, a foreshadowing of Jesus, right? He's choosing to bring her into his family, knowing full well who she is, all her flaws, where she came from, right? He's bringing her into the family anyway. He's declaring this woman, Ruth, the Moabite, is who I, I'm going to, to bring as my wife. And he says, the widow of Malon, I have bought to be my wife. And this, this verse says bought, um, but it's not really that he's buying Naomi and Ruth. That's not really what's happening here. Basically what he's saying is that um, he's securing this marriage. So that, that phrasing says bought here in the scripture um, that he's buying Naomi, but that's not really what's happening. He's declaring, I'm choosing to bind myself to her. I'm choosing to marry this woman. I'm making a public declaration that she is going to be part of my family, that she is going to be um, just like everything that defines me, my land, my family line, part of who, who I am is now going to include this woman, Ruth. Right? That's what he's saying when he's saying this to perpetuate the name of the dead for his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brothers and from the gates of his native place. You all are witnesses this day. He does it intentionally, proclaiming this in front of everybody. So there's no question. There's no question of the legality. There's no question of his intention. He's setting himself up to say, this is what I am doing. I'm bringing this family to be a part of mine and I am fully redeeming them and restoring their line. He's making sure that it's above board and that there's no questions or misunderstandings of his motives. He's going into it eyes wide open and he's choosing to bring Ruth into his family. And really the juxtaposition is pretty stark because the other kinsman was thinking only about what he already had. How is this transaction going to affect my current family, my heirs, my wealth, right? And Boaz, it's still gonna affect Boaz, but Boaz, is thinking only of his care for Naomi and Ruth. He's only thinking of how he can care for these two women. He's making choices to show God's loving kindness with no regard for himself, which is really what Ruth did too. She's showing God's loving kindness to Naomi with very little regard for herself. Ruth was a Moabite and she didn't really deserve this kind of kindness, but Boaz gives it anyway. So I'm going to bring this to a close this morning by asking you a question. Are you in the arena? God's love is shown through relationships, which I believe that it is. His love is what changes people. It's not my sermons. It's not EJ's sermons. It's not a good book. It's not a good argument. It is only God's love that changes us, that impacts us. So how are you showing God's love in your everyday life, in your everyday decisions to the people around you? And are you doing it because you feel obligated? Well, a good Christian should do these things. Are you sticking to kind of the letter of the law? Or are you being extravagant? Are you risking the mess of relationship? Are you putting yourself in kind of uncomfortable situations, difficult situations sometimes, vulnerable situations to let people not only get to know you, but get to know the Jesus who you carry? How are you showing God's loving kindness? Or are you making excuses? Like, well, I'm not really qualified for that. EJ can show God's loving kindness. Well, Darcy can do that, right? I, I can't do that. I have too many issues. I'm too messed up. If you only knew what I just did this morning or last night, right? If they only knew all of this mess that I carry around with me, I, I can't show Jesus. I, I can't do that. You know, if you are willing, God will use you as you are. He will. He'll use your mess, actually. He'll use your awkward and your challenges and your sin and your strange he'll use that to make people feel comfortable to feel safe he'll use every little bit of who you are and only you are you you need to be in the arena 
God needs you. Not the you that you wish you could be. Not the you that you will be someday or that you hope that you were. But the you that you are now. And if you're willing, he will do it. So I'm going to ask you to do is stand with me. And I really want to do something to respond this morning to this. Um, and I know this makes people uncomfortable, and that's okay. We're going to get in the arena, okay? So let's do this together. I want everybody to come to the front. So step out of your seats. Let's, let's get in the arena this morning. Let's come to the front and engage with what God is going to do today. So what I want to do as we're coming is I want you to think what gets in your way. And maybe immediately you know. <laughs> You're already like, I know this is what gets in my way, right? But maybe God will show you. But what is it that gets in your way? What is it that stops you from engaging with the people around you? Maybe sometimes you feel that nudge and you just, nope, I can't do that, God. And you just ignore it and you move forward. Maybe you don't feel the nudge, but you just know it's the right thing to do. And you just let that fear, that inadequacy, that embarrassment, that awkwardness stop you from engaging with the people around you and right in front of you. All right, so I want you to go ahead and close your eyes. And I'm going to ask you to... Just tell the Lord that you are willing. And even if you're not willing but you want to be, go ahead and say that. God, I want to be willing. God, we are willing. We are willing, Lord. God, help us, use us. We are willing, Father. God, we let go of everything that gets in our way and we just give it to you this morning. any excuse we make, any fear, we command that fear to go in the name of Jesus Christ. And we take a step in the arena. Feelings of inadequacy. We don't believe you. You are not true. We are adequate because the Lord has made us so. We can love people well because you first loved us. And God, we're willing, we're willing to try. We're willing to go, we're willing to make mistakes. We're willing to err again and again and again because showing your loving kindness to people around us is a worthy cause. We are willing, Father. And I ask this morning that you just start removing barriers Start removing things that get in our way, things that build themselves us, that s up inside of us, that stop us from engaging with one another. It doesn't have to be big. God, we just take a step and we say that we are willing, Lord.
thank you, Father, for what you did for us on the cross, that you made a way for us to carry your love inside of us and, and represent you to the world. And God, this morning we say we will go. We are willing to engage with the people around us. We're willing to be used in all of our messiness and all of our inadequacy, God, that we are, we give all of that to you because it's through you that we can do any of this anyway. God, we trust you. We trust that you cover when we make mistakes. You're bigger than all of that, God, that you will lead people to yourself in spite of us sometimes, but through us sometimes, God, and we just say yes. We are willing, Father, and we, we ask that you open our eyes and our ears to, to see the opportunities in front of us. I ask, Father, that you give divine appointments and, and recognition of when you're putting people in our lives. I ask, Father, that we, we would hear the words to say to people and we would, we would risk it. We would say those things to people and just, you know, I don't know, but I, I really feel like God wants me to say this to you today, that we would take that risk. God, that we would risk the, the uncomfortableness of that and the messiness of that, that somebody might encounter you, that they might be changed and transformed by your loving kindness, that you through us would show your said your loving kindness to the world. God, we are willing. We are willing. And we won't let anything get in our way. We thank you that you use us, God, that you use imperfect beings and that you're always working in us to make us more and more like you. And I pray that every day we, we do better. When we get up and we try again and, and we do better because we are willing. Our hearts are willing, Lord. This week, I'm gonna challenge you to look for opportunities. I've been praying about this for weeks, that God would give you opportunities to engage with people and show Him, show them his love. And it doesn't have to be weird and Christian-y, like God loves you and I thought I should tell you that. Right, you don't have to do it that way. Maybe you, maybe you will, but you don't have to. Right? It's just maybe it's a hug. You can tell someone needs a hug, go hug them. You can tell someone needs a kind word, give them a kind word, a compliment. Right? You can tell someone needs physical help. You don't have to say anything, just go help. Right? There's all kinds of ways that you can show God's loving kindness to the people around you. And I just pray that as you go forward this week that you would see those things. And not only see them, but you would be obedient and you would take action. Because that's what has said is it's not just feeling like you care for people, but it's acting on that care that God has given you. And you can all do it. You're all qualified. Love you guys. Go out and show God's loving kindness in the world. And don't forget if you want to come to the Next Steps luncheon, it is in the back, but you're all dismissed. And enjoy that playoff football today too, guys.